decided to, decided to turn my microphone. <laughs> that way down. The fitting title for this sermon would be Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? <laughs> you ever thought about that? What it'd be like to be a millionaire? This morning we're going to look at the book of Esther. And Esther is one of those shadow books. It's a shadow of things to come. You know, there were two great prophets, two great men, Nehemiah and Ezra, who were contemporaries. And they played a significant role in God's people returning back to the promised land. 50,000 Jews left Persia and went back to the promised land. That sounds like a lot of people. 50,000 is about the size of the city of Titusville. But that was only a drop in the bucket for the millions of Jews who lived in Persia. And many of those Jews, the concept of God was not relevant. Which is why the book of Esther is such a relevant book for God's people living in the last days. We live in an era when people do not consider God as a relevant concept. We live in a world in which Revelations 12, 13, 14 tell us that society will see Sabbath keepers as domestic terrorists. They will look to minimize their influence. And so, and during the World War II, when millions of Jews were being exterminated, the book of Esther was their book of hope. Because no matter how bad things could be, God is still in charge. Amen. He is still in control. But this book begins by telling the story of a man who wasn't content with being a millionaire. He wanted to be a billionaire. And so he has this beginning of his kingdom. He has 127 provinces all the way from India to Ethiopia. He was the most powerful man in the world. And his name is Xerxes. Now in your Bible it says Azarares. That's his Hebrew name. But his Greek name is Xerxes. Which is a whole lot easier to pronounce. And the author of this book wants you to be impressed. 180, 127 provinces. It takes him about two years to consolidate his kingdom, which he inherited from Darius I. And he invites all his military people for this amazing party. 127 kingdoms represented there. A party that would last 180 days. I cannot imagine a party that long. What did they do for 180 days besides drink? Now, Azarius wasn't having this party just because he was a good guy. He was actually known as a tyrant, as a very vicious ruler. But he wanted to go to war against the Greeks. What does Daniel 2 tell us happens to the Persians when the Greeks come around? They lose. In fact, he has his party for, and for 120, 180 days, shows off all his riches, seduces his generals to believe that they can win. And when he does go to war with the Greeks, they fight for two to four years, he loses, and loses much of his wealth. And verse 4 says, he wanted to show off his royal glory, his splendor, his prompt, his greatness. He had everything the world had to offer. There used to be a show in which they narrator would take you through the homes of celebrities. And in one hour, it would show you their riches. As a took 180 days to show how rich he was. 
And just in case they weren't impressed, at the end of the 180 days, he throws a second party for seven days in which he invites everybody from the city to come. There are three men, Ted Turner, Bill Gates, and Steve Jobs. These three men had one common goal, to be the richest and most powerful men in the world and to be the first one to accomplish that. Verse 6 through 8 tells us about how all the riches and all the jewels that this king had in his kingdom. Even his couches were gold and silver. He had mother of pearl, precious stones to walk on. I read about a rapper who made his dog a collar. It cost $75,000 for that dog's collar. But you know, $75,000 would have only bought a small plaid or a small square on the floor of King Hazarius. He drinks out of cups of gold. The only other place we read about drinking out of cups of gold is in the temple in the, in the tabernacle. And by the time the story of Esther comes around, the temple's gone. So from an outsider, it looks like as there is, is in charge. It looks like if you follow his path, you get all your dreams fulfilled. That's what the author believes, his culture believes. Isn't that our culture today? Riches, power, gold, wealth. He was spreading out his splendor for everybody to see. If you follow me, all your dreams will, become, will come true. It hasn't changed much, has it? People are still thinking that. In fact, if that, if that party happened today, there'd be cameras there, wouldn't there? There'd be some kind of reality show about it. Our culture is the same as the culture of the Persians. Wealth, power, pleasure, comfort, and control. Sometimes we're tempted to buy into that culture. You ever felt that, temper, that temp temptation? He said, if I only had, if I only had this, I'd be happy. The problem is the person who gets that, next thing they find themselves saying, man, if I only had that, if I only had more, like the Joneses in the my mother was really big on the Joneses and the Smiths. Whenever our neighbor did something, she had to have it. Whatever it was, she had to have it. A certain look, a certain body. I remember going to get my hair cut. And this guy flops in, sits on the chair, and says to the lady who's cut, about to cut his hair, if you can cut my hair in a way that makes me happy, my tip will be $50. The manager threw it out. He said, there's nothing you could do to make a person like that happy. Because happiness can't be bought, can't be purchased. For some of you, it's a certain type of home or a certain kind of job or a certain relationship. For others, it's simply, I'll be happy if people respect me. But the book of Esther comes to unmask the facade and show the truth. On the last days of the feast, the king is absolutely drunk. And verse 9 says, he says to his eunuchs, bring Queen Vashti into the king's presence, wearing her royal high turban. And he wanted to show the people and the officials her beauty because she was attractive. So if they weren't impressed after 180 days of seeing this magnificent facility, walking on Merle, Mother of Pearl, on the floor. They weren't impressed. Wait till they see his wife. And what did his wife say? Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. She was one smart lady. Because he wanted to treat his wife as a concubine, as a sex toy. This is the Queen Vestash refused to come to the king's bidding, conveying to the eunuchs 
And the king became angry and was consumed with rage. He'd been having this party. Everybody was having a great time. The only thing that people were going to remember was his wife wouldn't listen to him. Man, have you ever had that problem? Your wife just wouldn't listen to you? That was his problem. As we're close as he, the king became in, in, enraged and his anger burned within him. The richest, most powerful man in the world who throws a party for 187 days and he ends up angry. I've got all of this and yet I'm empty. And so he turns to his counselors. The problem with his counselors is they're all drunk, just like he is. And their counsel is horrific. Notice verse 16. One of the men named Minicum steps up and says before the king and the princess, Vashti the queen, have not done wrong to the king only, but to all the princes and to all the people that are in the provinces of King Azarus. The deed of the queen shall come abroad to all women, so they shall despise their husbands and their eyes. And when it shall be reported, the king as yours commanded Vashti the queen be brought before him, but she came not. Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this to thee, to all the king's princes which have heard of the deeds of the queen, they shall arise to much contempt and wrath. So the counselor says, King, Everybody's going to hear about this. This is embarrassing. This is national security. What your wife has done, every woman in Persia is going to do the same thing. So how do you fix this problem? Verse 19. And he says, if it please the king, let a royal order go out. How do you get your wife to respect you? You pass a law. <laughs> Wives must respect their husbands. He obviously had to be drunk to come up with such a crazy idea <laughs> that you can demand respect, that you can demand to be appreciated and to be loved and to be obeyed. And the king was humiliated. He doesn't want everybody to know, but his counselor says, send this decree. Verse 20 says, the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout his entire kingdom. All women must honor their husbands, rich or poor. They must honor their husbands. And so now the whole nation knows what Vashti did. The king was incredibly humiliated. I think he needed new counselors. Suddenly his greatness seems paper thin. He may be the king of a vast kingdom. He may be able to throw a party for 187 days. But he can't get his wife to listen to him. And yes, the laws of the Medes and the Persians cannot be altered and must be obeyed. There must have been a lot of quiet laughing going on when the proclamation went out. Both by women and by men. The book of Esther exposes the foolishness of putting things of this world ahead of God. It makes it radically clear that the things of this world are not big enough to satisfy us. I had a church owner who he, he lived from paycheck to paycheck. One day I was visiting his house and he had just bought this new top of the line home entertainment center. He couldn't afford to put food on the table, couldn't afford to pay his utility bills. So I said, why, why don't you do that? He says, I wanted to know what it feels like to be rich. A lot of people have that same mentality. They want more. The more doesn't do it, does it? Something, if they just get a different job, they'll be happy. Or 
If they have children, then they'll be happy. And that could be true. Having children brings a lot of joy and happiness. As long as the wife changes the diapers, it brings lots of joy. Or some would say, well, maybe owning the house would bring contentment. Or maybe if people were, were more impressed. Or maybe if you were a student or a college student, maybe you just made better grades, you'd be happy. But the world cannot bring us happiness. The thing that this world cannot bring us happiness it is only our trust in Jesus Christ. In Revelation 12, 13, 14 tell us the world is going to come crashing down. But God's still in charge. And even though we don't always understand what God is doing, and sometimes we may want to have a private conversation with God and explain things to Him, He knows what He's doing. And all He asks of us is to trust Him. In the time of Persia, the time of Queen Esther, his message was, trust me. I know it looks like you're going to be exterminated, but trust me. A hundred and eighty-seven days. So he can prepare for war. A hundred and twenty-seven provinces. A man who had everything. But the book of Esther reminds us that God keeps his promises. Even when we don't see him, even when we can't hear him, or even feel him, he keeps his promises. God is present. Imagine if we put it in a modern day scenario of President Trump took off six months and used tax dollars to throw himself a huge party for all his friends. And at the end, he made a law that said all wives must respect their husbands. CNN would have a heyday with something like that, wouldn't they? Fox News would go crazy. That's pretty much what it is in the book of Esther. The only difference between Asperger's and Trump is that Trump doesn't drink alcohol. But God is in control. And God keeps his promises. And he has promises that no matter what trials we go through, he's there with us. And the people who were in the concentration camps, many of them said, God is dead. As they read the book of Esther, they were reminded, God is not dead. We don't always understand what he's doing, but he does. He keeps his promises. No recession, no dictator, no terrorist, no natural disaster will ever be able to thwart God's promises. Nothing will thwart his promises. So whatever's going on in your life, don't be afraid. Don't be terrified. The Bible tells us Trust him. Now the Bible tells us about another king, a better king, and his name is Jesus, and he is the king of kings, and we, his people, are his bride, and he's nothing like Asperger's. Remember, Asperger sent the eunuchs to tell his wife, come so he can show her off as a sex toy, so he can expose her humiliate her just to make himself look better. In contrast, Jesus didn't send his servants to call his bride. He came from heaven, came to earth, clothed in human flesh to be our king. And even though his people did not accept him, even though his chosen people rejected him, he came to conquer death. Remember, we're all born under the same decree for the wages of sin is death. Jesus died that death for us. And instead of banishing his people like Ezra's did to his wife, Jesus chose to suffer our death decree. As Paul wrote in Hebrews 13, 12, 
talking about when Jesus says, So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Jesus chose the cross for us. Instead of rejecting us, he put his arms around us and showed us his love. Jesus comes to invite you and me to a feast. Unlike the feast of Nazareth, Isaiah 25, verse 6 says, In this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wine and lees, a fat things full of marrow of wine, and all the lees will be refined. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people, a veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off their faces, and the rebuke of his people shall take away from off all the earth the Lord has spoken. It's a powerful imagery. Taking off that veil, that veil of death. Esther opens up with a picture of a king who has everything. Riches, food. But Isaiah's passage tells us that there is a covering that even Azarias can't cast off. And that is the veil of death. And that only Jesus could remove that. Isaiah 25, 7 says that he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples and the veil that is spread over the nations. He will swallow up death forever. Isn't that encouraging? The devil may destroy this body, but he can't destroy this temple. We have this hope. And that's the feast we want to go to, not the feast of Nazareth. We want to go to the feast of Jesus. We want to go to this wedding in which the phrase, till death do us part, doesn't exist. A wedding where we're not treated like Vashti. Where the king is nothing like Azurus. A king who invites us experience true joy and true peace. At the age of 23, George Beverly Shea had a massive decision that he needed to make. And that was whether he would accept a job at a secular record company and make millions of dollars but not be able to sing religious songs. That was a choice he had to make. He was 23 years old. And he sat at the piano one Sunday morning, one Saturday afternoon, I guess it was, and he was wrestling with decision. Millions of dollars? Or keep singing in churches and on religious, religious radio programs. And he came across this poem by Mrs. R. F. Miller. And the Lord gave him the tune. That Sunday, he sang that song that he's so famous for. I'd rather have Jesus. Amen. The riches untold. As various thought, riches untold was the answer. George Beverly Shea discovered that the riches is Jesus. That's what it's happening. So this morning, let's, let's stand and dedicate our lives as we sing this hymn, 327. I'd rather have Jesus than riches and gold.
but you're very much alive. You're very much in control. Lord, help us to be faithful to you. Help us to choose Jesus instead of riches and gold. Help us to surrender our hearts and our minds to the influence of the Holy Spirit. That we can be difference makers for your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.